Then, uh, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, uh, second day of uh, the NAC. And uh, so today is the first uh, network, Nova Network, Network One, that will uh, uh, present uh, some of the work. I think I suggest everybody to uh, mute, uh, unless, of course, uh, you are uh, the speaker. Um, so let's get started with uh, Karina Caputi, and she will uh, give us an highlight, an overview of uh, some of the highlights from Network One. So, uh, Karina, I'll give you two minutes after 10, okay? So we have time for questions. Okay, I try to be brief. Thank you very much, Rafaela. And indeed, this is going to be just a series of recent highlights of the work that we have done in our network, Network One, about the formation and evolution of galaxies. Of course, this is not a complete list. As I said, it's just a selection of very recent work that has been completed in our network. So, okay. So just a quick reminder, especially for the youngest people, uh, that Network One deals with every aspect of the formation and evolution of galaxies, from the dawn of the universe and the first galaxies to the full formation and evolution of these objects in the universe through cosmic time, the whole process of galaxy assembly at all redshift. And of course, also the nature of the main constituents of the universe, baryonic matter, but also dark matter, and to a less extent, but also importantly, dark energy, something we know little about. So I will start with some recent results about the local universe. This is work done by the group of Scott Traeger in Groningen. And basically this first piece of work has to do with the study of early type galaxies in the coma cluster, both from population synthesis models and also with uh, theoretical simulations, uh, cosmological simulations to try to understand the orbits of galaxies in dark matter halos like the one in coma. And basically what they found is analyzing the orbits and the stellar populations of these galaxies, that these galaxies appear to have formed almost all of their stars by their uh, first pericenter passage within the cluster and not at the apocenter as it is normally known in the local universe. So by the time they reach the apocenter, a little after these galaxies will quench and they will really be early type galaxies. And this is similar to what we see in clusters, galaxy clusters at Redshift 1, where the effect of gas stripping is incredibly important in uh, the quenching of early type galaxies. From the same group, there is another piece of work, very interesting, about the first 3D modeling of ionized extraplanar gas in two nearby spiral galaxies where they found that there are vertical and radial inflows of gas, which are so important in these spiral galaxies that cannot be explained only with internal processes. They have to invoke really an interchange of gas with the circumgalactic and intergalactic medium. This is work led by Anchi Lee, a PhD student in Groningen in Scott Traeger's group. Also, this links a bit to something that is coming soon, which is the WIB spectrograph. WIB will be a, a high multiplexing spectrograph with almost 1,000 fibers covering two square degrees of the sky. So this will allow doing all this kind of work of galaxy uh, studies in the local universe and also higher redshift with a lot of detail. So stay tuned because there will be much of this science coming over the next decade. Changing subjects a bit, I'm going to talk about the KITS survey, which is a wide area optical survey with the VST telescope and particularly Omega Cam, a, ca a camera uh, to a good extent built by NOVA. Uh, the KITS survey is one of the public surveys led by uh, Kung Kauken. And this survey over a few squares uh, degrees what a few uh, a few thousand square degrees of the sky has led to very important papers, very recent papers, and one of it particularly analyzes uh, and tries to derive cosmological constant uh, from the analysis of these very wide area uh, surveys. What you see in this plot is a plot of sigma eight versus omega matter, 
and you see in colors the results of different probes. The one, uh, the, the results from kids are those highlighted in red. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. And basically what you have to see here is that the kids results are in very good agreement with other probes of galaxies uh, down from very big surveys, but they are quite different from the green contours, which are the results of Planck which may mean that sigma-8 as measured from galaxies is quite different from the sigma-8 determined from the cosmic microwave background data. So the results seem to be pretty accurate and to the extent that it could indicate that doing one thing or the other is not the same. So probably there is some kind of inconsistency in the cosmological models. But this of course needs further investigation and probably Euclid will have a, an important say in this kind of work. Also from kids, there is another uh, recent work by, uh, led by Margot Brouwer in Groningen and the group of Edwin Valentine. And basically what they do is to, is to study uh, more than 200 southern galaxies, which are isolated in the kids survey. And they can analyze the radial acceleration uh, to the outskirts of the galaxies to limits which are much beyond what typically can be studied with H1 rotation curves. So they probe far to the outskirts of these galaxies, which is the left-hand side of this diagram. This kind of analysis, comparing uh, the results of weak lensing and the uh, accel acceleration derived from the baryonic matter can uh, disentangle potentially between different uh, cosmological models. This kind of probe alone is not directly conclusive, but they could split their galaxies into early type and late type galaxies which are the red and blue points in this plot. And basically here, what you see is that the difference between the behavior of the radial acceleration uh, in the outskirts is very, very different for early type and late type galaxies. And the only way to explain this, this can be well explained with Lambda CDM, but not so well explained with modified gravity theories, unless, unless the uh, late type galaxies have a lot of gas in their dark matter halos, but uh, the, the amount of gas should be comparable to the amount of stars in these galaxies. And this is something still to be probed. Otherwise, this kind of plot will favor lambda CDM over modified gravities. On a different note, another important result from our network is the serendipitous discovery of the most metal poor globular cluster ever known in the local universe, and this corresponds to a, a globular cluster in M31. This is the work by Soren Larsen in Nijmegen, and it led to very important papers. And of course, there is a lot of follow-up of this system. This globular cluster is so metal poor that is uh, of the level of the lowest metallicity galaxies that we know at very high redshift. But this is more massive. So how was this globular cluster really formed? We don't know. At high redshift, also other results at high redshift correspond to analysis, the analysis of gas, uh, molecular gas from ALMA galaxies, molecular gas and atomic gas from ALMA galaxies. This is the work by um, the group of Filippo Fraternali and also John Mackey has been involved in this and is the study of SPT galaxies, submillimeter galaxies which are gravitationally lens, so they are incredibly bright. So here is, there is a combination of strong lensing modelings with the analysis of gas dynamics uh, in these galaxies. And the interesting result here is that these galaxies are normal disks, disks that behave like normal spirals in the local universe. And this is quite striking because most of the results we know at high redshift indicate that uh, disks are pretty turbulent, but this is not what is seen in this work. And this has been also independently confirmed, but another analysis of the same group with uh, in Redshift 6, uh, sorry, Redshift 5 galaxies, where they found regularly rotating galaxies at this very high redshift. Uh, also galaxies which have massive bulges. So this is a bit changing the picture of what we think is the dynamics of galaxies in, in the high redshift universe. And it's certainly quite in tension of the, with the predictions of galaxy formation models. So I guess there is much more to come about this. Further investigation is needed to understand what's going on. Now, also using ALMA and in combination with HST stellar maps, 
uh, a group in Leiden. This is a work led by the PhD student Leinhard Bogart and uh, also uh, Richard Bowens and Paul van der Werf all uh, involved in this is the study of galaxies at high redshift and try to understand the link between the molecular gas revealed by ALMA with the stellar emission from the HSD images. And this kind of work reveals that the, the, the rate at which galaxies grow and the cold gas is consumed is, is really could be set up for the first time in a, in a very precise manner, thanks to the, this combined work. Also from the combination of ALMA maps and uh, optical data, there was uh, some recent work also uh, this time in, in Groningen with the discovery of a galaxy group associated with an ALMA galaxy at Redshift 4. This is a Two lens minutes. galaxy group, sorry? Two minutes. Okay, so I'll try to go quickly. So the importance of this galaxy group associated with an ALMA galaxy at high redshift, in fact, is that it's a piece of indication that the environment of uh, ALMA galaxies and submillimeter galaxies could be richer than what we think it is today. And this is very important because submillimeter galaxies are progenitors of local massive galaxies. So understanding when the rich environment of local massive galaxies was formed is uh, super important. So if this was in place at early core cosmic times, this is, uh, this is what this kind of work is indicating, that the, the element of massive galaxies could have been in place early in cosmic time. Also, I want to announce the imaging data release, the first imaging data release of aperitive data after so many years of work. So I invite you to visit the Astron website to look at uh, the data release and also the number of papers that have been associated with this data. This is something very important for our network. And finally, I would like to give a few words about other radio probes, and particularly the, the probe of the, the, the epoch of reionization probe via the study of the 21 centimeter line. I mean, this is something that is going on. There are some predictions from some groups in Groningen. And well, but uh, uh, even if this has uh, is not established yet, and the signal has been hasn't been measured yet, there is uh, there are very important upper limits already measured for the the signal that we expect at a high redshift from uh, well, this is not twenty one centimeter, but other uh, lower frequencies. But there are, there is a strong upper limits of where the signal should be. And this is a work almost ready by Florent Martins in, in Groningen. And well, I, I suggest you to follow this because well, this could be the first step towards really measuring the signal from the epoch of reionization with radio data. So this is just to say, we, we, we are doing a lot of very exciting science in the network one, but there is much more to come. We know that there are uh, important facilities coming to scene very soon. JWST will be launched at the end of this year. Euclid will be launched in two years from now. We will have the ELT, SKA, Athena, and all this is promising an amazing decade of discoveries, discoveries that is about to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Nice summary. So we have time for um, a question. You can write in the chat or just uh, start talking. Um, I have uh, one general question. So I, um, I actually enjoy very much the uh, virtual meeting that the uh, Network One had in uh, December and in January. And they really gave uh, the opportunity to, to see all the, the variety of the projects. So I was wondering whether uh, in addition to the, we hope to go more on uh, real meeting soon, to go back to the real meeting, but whether this uh, virtual meeting can be maintained just to um, improve the exchange of uh, information. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, this is an interesting idea. I think we should try to meet in person once or twice per year, but perhaps in between, we could try to do more regular meetings, just combining this methodology of doing some live meetings and some uh, online meetings. I mean, perhaps a hybrid uh, methodology will help us stay more connected. And I think that would be very welcome. We need to discuss that. Uh, we haven't decided yet, uh, but yes, I think it's a good idea to try to have more regular meetings without having to travel, you know, 
four times a year, which probably nobody wants to do, but leave meetings once or twice per year will be very healthy. And then probably stay connected with online meetings, shorter online meetings could also help. I think it's a good point. Yeah, there is so much going on that I thought was uh, good to see this. Um, okay, there is a comment from uh, Amina. Amina, do you want to mention this? To, uh, that NOBA is encouraging at least the three network meetings per year? Yeah, indeed, we would like to see that. Um, and I think indeed what you suggest of having a, you know, a meeting in person or two, and then the rest online, that is a, a, good, deal, a good idea. And also, I think that you could also envision smaller group uh, uh, meetings, say within the network, just the people that are working on similar topics, right? So, but I think at least three meetings a year would be great to have. Or intranetwork, because of course there are also overlap. Uh, Absolutely, among yes. Sometimes they get a bit yeah. 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 So, indeed. So I think we should take advantage of the fact that we're now more used to these kind of meetings to, to uh, stimulate those interactions. Yeah, there were in the past, we had many of them like that with also smaller, not the whole Nova network one, but just smaller bits of it. And somehow this has disappeared. Okay, something to keep in mind then. Uh, I think we have to move on now. Thanks, Karina, for this. And the, of course, the conversation can continue on the chat or on the Slack or whatever is your favorite way. So, um, so the next speak, speaker is um, uh, Taymor uh, Taifolai. Oh, there was a, a question from Scott. Sorry, will be in the chat. Um, Taymor, if you want to share your screen. Yes, I'm going ahead to share my screen. Good. And so um, Temor is going to uh, tell us about the story of ultra diffuse galaxy as told by their globular cluster. Yes. Uh, thank you, Rafaela. And uh, thank you, organizers, for giving me the chance to talk here. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my presentation? Yes. Okay, yes. Great. So my name is Taimur Seyfullahi, and currently I'm a PhD student at Captain City in Groningen. And today I'm going to talk about my research in the past few years, which, uh, which is on topic of ultra diffuse galaxies, which are quite interesting topic uh, in galaxy evolution in the past years. So galaxies in universe are uh, observed in different properties, uh, shapes, luminosities, and sizes. However, the most fundamental property of galaxies is the mass, which is dominated by dark matter. In this respect, we can divide galaxies into subgroups, massive galaxies like Milky Way and M31 and dwarf or low mass galaxies. However, mass is the hardest to measure. So we look at other observables. For example, I bring your attention, I bring it to your attention to uh, look at this diagram here that presents effective radius or sizes of galaxies on the y-axis and surface brightness of galaxies on the x-axis. On the right side of plot, you see where the Esselon digital cluster have galaxies, or which mostly are massive uh, galaxies, including elliptical spirals like Milky Way. On the bottom, you see dwarf galaxies, which are smaller and lower in surface brightness. The blank area here was quite empty out of galaxies uh, until a few years ago, where Van Dokum and collaborators found many objects here, followed by many, many other observations of other groups. And now we have a class of objects we call ultra diffuse galaxies or UTGs. Because of large effective radius or size of these objects and low surface brightness of these galaxies, they have a very fuzzy diffuse appearance like this, especially when you compare it with other type of galaxies. Well, this picture will be more impressive when you go to space and look with Hubble Space Telescope. So one of the main questions uh, about ultra diffuse galaxies in the beginning was if they are massive galaxies or dwarf galaxies. So this question, for the first answer, would, would, we would say that if the galaxies are massive, we expect a halo mass of about like Milky Way, about 10 to 12 solar masses. In the case that are dwarf galaxies, at most they're as heavy as LMC or M33. 
with halo mass of 10 to 11. The majority of studies showed that UDGs are actually dwarf galaxies. Uh, well, the majority of the population of UDGs are dwarf galaxies. They use different proxies for mass estimation. So considering this, whether they are massive or low mass dwarf galaxies, there's another question that we should ask. And that is, if they're dwarfs, why they're large? If they're massive, why they are low surface brightness? In, in general, why they look different than the other type of galaxies? There have been many suggestions in this regard to explain the appearance. However, for my presentation, I'm going to focus on the first question and hopefully have an answer at the end. So if, if UDGs are dwarf galaxies, that's another concept. But if they're massives, uh, massive galaxies, we expect that the extreme ones are massive galaxies. By extreme, I mean the largest ones. So one of these large UDGs uh, that was quite interesting for several years, it is uh, Dragonfly 44 in Coma Cluster. The galaxy, uh, based on the stellar kinematic studies, showed that to have a mass of 10 to 12 solar masses, which is consistent with a, ma a mass of Milky Way. So this can be a massive galaxy. However, since the measurements of such kinematics are uncertain, also the mass measurements at the end is based on some assumptions on the dark matter profile, people use other proxies to estimate mass. For example, for one, as a one estimation, people use number of global clusters. This is based on this correlation between number of global clusters around the galaxy and the total mass, dynamical mass of a galaxy. We already know this for other galaxies. It also has been shown that it works for UDGs. So people use this and calculated about 100 global cluster around the Dragonfly 44. Compared to Milky Way, which has 160 global cluster, it makes sense that the galaxy has a mass similar to Milky Way. So this galaxy was a um, as was an example of being a massive galaxy. Com in, compar in comparison with the star mass for the galaxy, which is about 10 to 8, about 100 times less than Milky Way, this galaxy must contain 99.99% .99 dark matter, which is quite a challenge for models. Why? Because when we look at the relation that we know for halo mass versus star mass to halo mass ratio, we expect that galaxies based on different models, observations, simulations, they follow these lines. However, based on the estimation for Dragonfly 44, the galaxy would be here, very off from what we expect. So since the, since the idea of the galaxy being a massive galaxy was mostly based on global cluster number count, we started to question the fact that this galaxy has 100 global clusters. We look at the same data of Hubble Space Telescope that was used in the past, and we try to see how many global clusters we count and if we can reproduce the result uh, of the previous works. We search for global cluster candidates. I call them candidates because they are photometrically selected, not spectroscopically selected. And therefore, uh, we are not 100% uh, sure about these objects being global cluster. But our photometric uh, analysis is uh, quite uh, good. What we found interestingly for the galaxy is that the global clusters have a more compact distribution than what was assumed in the previous studies. So the previous studies assumed some distribution based on the values in the literature. But once we use a stricter selection for global cluster, we could observe that the distribution is compact. And if we use assume that this distribution is like this, following other assumptions, we can measure the number of global cluster in a better way. And the number that we calculated was about 20. So this difference shows that this galaxy is not 99.99% dark matter. The mass is almost one over magnitude less. And it is a dwarf galaxy with about 10 to 11 solar mass. And this brings the galaxy here. Okay, problem solved with the Dragonfly 44, but there is still this idea that some of these large UDGs can be uh, massive. So we, we looked at six other ultra diffuse galaxies, again, the coma cluster, including Dragonfly 44, we new data set as a follow-up study for the galaxy itself to see whether th there is a massive galaxy among these large UDGs. We look at the global clusters in the same manner as the other work and measure observables based on global clusters, including global cluster number, global cluster luminosity function, and global cluster radio profile. 
for the whole sample. And then I'm going to compare each of these observables with the same observable in massive galaxies and dwarf galaxies in the literature and judge whether these galaxies are more consistent with being dwarf or massive. The first observable is the number of global clusters. Same as before, the average value that we get is about 20 ranges between 10 to 30, consistent with the mass of 10 to 11 for all these galaxies. So again, these galaxies, even the largest UDGs are not massive, they all are dwarfs. Second observable, the global cluster luminosity function, which is a function that presents a number of global clusters around the galaxy in a given magnitude or given luminosity, or you can also convert it to mass of the global cluster itself. We expect this function to be a Gaussian with a peak and a width, which we can measure. The value of mu is the peak of the luminosity function that is measured, and sigma is the width, describes the width of the luminosity function. We can simply con compare these values with the values of massive galaxies and dwarf galaxies, and what we see that the value of the peak is consistent with both massive and dwarfs, and general value of peak is quite universal. But value of sigma is consistent, for UDG's value of sigma is consistent with dwarf galaxies. So this is another observation that shows dwarf galaxies, uh, UDGs are actually dwarf galaxies. The third observable here uh, was, is radio profile of global clusters. I want to uh, bring it into your attention, this parameter here which describes the global clusters half number radius, which is a radius that contains half of the global clusters around the galaxy over galaxies half-life radius or effective radius. It, it also a, a radius that contains half of the light of the galaxy or half of the stars. When we compare this value with the literature, we see that again, UDGs are consistent with dwarf galaxies. So this third observable also tells us the same, gives us the same message. Something interesting on the side that we noticed is that for this UDGs, global clusters are a bit more extended than what, than what we expect for a galaxy with NFW profile. What I mean is that for an NFW profile, we expect that it has a core, sorry, it has a cusp. We expect that in time, uh, in time scale less than a few giga years, global clusters sink, spall down to the center of the galaxy. But this is not something that we observe for these UDGs. Two this minutes. reminds us something quite Two similar minutes. to four next dwarf galaxy. And the conclusion here is that the profile of these galaxies doesn't have a cause, but indeed it points to a core in the center of the dark matter distribution. This would be something very interesting for Euclid since we will have uh, several examples like Fornax dwarf galaxy. We will have more global clusters around these galaxies and something to explore in the future. So at the end, as I promised, I'm going to answer the question that I asked in the beginning that massive or low mass galaxies, which one are UDGs or at least the large UDGs I worked on? The answer is dwarfs. So for the second question, I just say that now we should make uh, simulations of UDGs that incorporate global cluster formation at the same time and then test whether these models, any of these models can explain the observation, the observables that we have here for global clusters. I leave my conclusion here and I hope the main message be clear here that ultra diffuse galaxies are dwarfs and even the most extreme ones, the largest ones, as I showed here today, there are also dwarf galaxies, less massive than 10 to 11. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfectly on time. So time for question. Uh, Scott. Great stuff, Tamor. I have a question about your um, globular cluster luminosity function measurement. Um, I'm puzzled by why you say that dwarfs and, and giants should have different um, central values here. Um, it, is, is this assuming a distance to the coma cluster? Um, because I was under the impression that basically the global cluster luminosity function was pretty much universal. Okay, so first of all, the values that I'm mentioning here are all 
change will transform from uh, the absolute magnitude to apparent magnitude, but for the same distance. Okay, so the distance is not a matter here. Uh, the thing is, observationally, this peak is not totally universal. It changes for mass from massive galaxies to dwarf galaxies. Not all the observations show the same result, but for for some other works, there is this difference, and the difference is not that much. For example, for M87, the peak is about 0.2 magnitude brighter than dwarf satellites in Vega. And uh, the reason is not really clear, but we can say that maybe uh, more massive galaxies uh, destroy more, less massive global clusters. So that's why the peak would be a bit brighter at the end or more massive. Okay. So there is a question from Arish and a couple of questions on the chat. Arish, uh, you, you go. Yeah, I, I have a naive question. So in the beginning, you said that 10 to the 12 was measured based on kinematics yes. of the galaxy. But then later you said you measured a lower value based on counting globular clusters. Yes. Given that these galaxies are so different, why should we expect the same relationship of total halo mass to number of globular clusters to apply to them? Is there a physical reason why well, they apply to every galaxy? So there is no physical reason to say they're different. Uh, let's say there, there have been other studies in the past that showed they independently found global clusters based on spectroscopy and they found out that, uh, so they have number of global clusters from something else just by finding a global cluster based on spectroscopy. They also have mass based on another proxy, completely independent, and they look at this relation and they saw that UDGs also follow the same relation. So that's the basis, that's the observational basis. Also theoretically, there is an idea behind it that galaxies, uh, more massive galaxies, they accreted more, more dwarf galaxies and they also accreted or collected more global clusters in time. So at the end, this relation both has observational evidence, and also sort of theoretical uh, motivation. Okay, thanks. Okay, there is uh, one question from uh, Kung Kalkan in the chat uh, about what is the prospect for direct dynamical mass measurement. Kun, if you want to ask yourself, but in the meantime, maybe I read your question. <laughs> It's basically the same question as Harish asked. If they're, you're using all these proxies, but there's also a direct dynamical measurement, why don't you believe that one? So dynamical measurement for these galaxies, since they have a very low surface brightnesses, is not easy. And also, they are, these are, uh, so you don't know the profile of dark matter. The problem is, for example, there is uh, the work of 2019 that, uh, here, I, I, I mentioned Van der Kuhn 2019 as well. The work of 2019, the value that measured for mass was 10 to 11, and the upper limit was 10 to 12, simply. And it was based on some other distribution. Based on NFW distribution, they could derive a mass even one magnitude uh, smaller. So there are lots of uncertainties, both from the data itself and from assumptions. That's why this method, uh, well, it's not the best to, to judge some, to say something like a galaxy is massive or not, it's certain. Okay, thank you. I think we should move on. There is one question from Ranir on the chat. Maybe you should oh. check that. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you it's fine. It's not, it's not uh, so important. Sure not so important. Other opportunity to discuss with Ranir. So, Let's move on to, um, to the next talk by Fang Yao Gao. Uh, can you share your screen? And this is on the nature of uh, hyperluminous infrared galaxies. Mm, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Can you put? Yeah, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Um, OK. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fang Yao. I'm a PhD student at Captain in Groningen. Uh, today, uh, I first I want to thank the committee for accepting my talk. Today, I'm going to talk about my recent work, mm -hmm. The Nature of Hyperluminous infrared, infrared Galaxies. And here is a, a, defini here is a definition of hyperluminous infrared galaxies, aka HLUX. 
there are uh, infrared luminosity integrating from rest frame 8 to 1000 microns should above 10 to the 13 solar luminosities. And our data is based on Herschel catalog, then cross matched by a low far lots deep fields catalog to find the multi wavelength counterparts for Herschel sources. And we, uh, we have three deep fields and we we have three deep fields and we used flux cut in at uh, uh, Herschel to 50 micro and we deblend Herschel fluxes when there are multiple counterparts cross the match for Herschel and here is the uh, we use uh, deblend Herschel uh, we deblend Herschel fluxes using XID plus uh, hmm? mm. sorry for that we deblend Herschel fluxes using XID plus taking advantage of the tight correlation between far infrared and the radio. These two plots are taken from our first paper. We take this as example. This is one uh, spiral source. There are three low far sources uh, within 18 hexagons, and uh, we uh, we calculated the low far to Herschel flux ratio as a function of redshift for the unique sample, which means there are only one low far source uh, matching to one spot, uh, Herschel source. We calculate the mean values here. With this mean value and the low far sources, we can get the expected Herschel flux. This expected Herschel flux for each uh, component will uh, serve as priors in XID plus and uh, to, to derive the deblended uh, Herschel fluxes. The, uh, this is a model map and this is a residual map. And in the end, we select over 500 edge lux in three fields. We use SED feeding codes to derive galaxy properties. We use uh, two SED feeding codes, Sigel that assumes energy balance and the Cygnus that does not assume energy balance. And we use three AGM models, E95, F6, and S12 to compare uh, results derived from different codes and models. And here is the AGM library, libraries used in our study. We can see that the E95 have a, a wider range of spectrum and uh, uh, they have a prominent feature in the, uh, in the longer wavelength range than the other two AGM models. And we first compare the galaxy properties derived from different SED feeding codes and AGM models. Uh, this is a stellar mass and infrared luminosity between Sigel S12 in the Y axis and three signals results in the X axis. We can see there is no significant offset, systematic offset here. And the way to term still star formation rate and uh, AGM luminosity, there is a large dispersion between Sigel S12 and, and uh, Cygnus E95. Uh, this also shows in the agent libraries uh, as E95 tend to attribute more infrared luminosity due to AGN rather than uh, star formation. So they have, they produce smaller star formation rates. And here is the stellar mass as a function uh, versus redshift in our study. And we can see our uh, actual span a wide range in redshifts, and they are very massive with a median value of 10 to the 12. The, uh, the blue ones are all our actual and the orange crosses are a subsample. We, uh, we define a subsample of conservative good quality. And here is the co moving volume density of actual and we find there are many, uh, many more uh, ultra massive galaxies above 10 to the 12 are uh, missed in previous studies. Oh, I forgot to mention that our, uh, most of our HLUX are above the characteristic stellar mass of previous studies of uh, global stellar mass functions. And uh, uh, one explanation of why we find many ultra massive galaxies missed. In, in the literature is survey size. Uh, our samples have a, large, uh, have a large survey size with a combined survey size of 26 square degrees. And uh, considering a conservative subsample, that will give us one uh, to two ultra massive galaxies per square degree. And the previous studies, they covered a sm much smaller area 
uh, uh, two, three de square degrees. So there are only a few ultramassive galaxies can be included in their studies. And we calculated the number density of massive atrolux above 10 to the 11. And we uh, integrate pr uh, global stellar mass functions using the same threshold. And we can see that towards higher ratios, the um, uh, massive atrolux occupy a, a larger fraction and uh, they are important in towards higher ratios. Uh, similar, uh, a similar conclusion can be, can be found in the contribution to the cosmic stellar mass density plot. And these are uh, data take, taken from literature and uh, our, our, our sample shows uh, increasing importance towards higher ratios. And we also studied the star formation rate activity. Uh, we first look at the star formation mass sequence, a tight correlation between star formation rate and the stellar mass. We use speaker 2040 mean sequence. Here is the delta mean sequence as a function of the red shift for Sigel S12 and Cygnus E95, color coded by agent fraction. And most of our atrox above the uh, zero, meaning they are active star forming. And the, the blue, uh, the yellow ones, atrox with large agent fractions are more likely to have smaller delta mean sequence or negative values. Um, we separate them uh, into different uh, redshifts. Here is the agent fraction as function of delta mean sequence. And we fit three signals results together using uh, the green lines here. And we fit two Seagull results here, the uh, black solid lines here. We find there is a, there is a, uh, the atrox with large agent fraction are, more, are associated with uh, a lower delta mean sequence and uh, atrox with uh, smaller agent fractions are associated with positive delta mean sequence. This agrees with agent quenching and this uh, this anti-correlation becomes stronger at higher ratios. And uh, here is the contribution to the cosmic stellar uh, star formation rate density. The black, uh, black lines and empty squares here are taken from literature. We, of, we also uh, plot the contribution from LUX and the ULUX here. And uh, with, uh, as the cosmic star formation rate density drops after, after its peak around the two, uh, and while the contribution from atrox remains uh, relatively flat, so the contribution from atrox increases at, uh, at higher ratios. We also study the black hole growth rate as um, we use this formula to derive the uh, black hole growth rate. And we also plot the previous studies of X-ray AGNs, which finds an increasing trend here. But uh, we didn't find any uh, significant trends here. We, they are relatively flat. So we propose that uh, uh, our HLX may represent a maximum value of black hole growth rate in, in such extremely um, dusty uh, star forming galaxies. Uh, here is the agent luminosity uh, as a function of star formation rate. We also plot previous studies of uh, X-ray agents, quasar, which finds a flat, a flat correlation, increasing correlation, or, or decreasing correlation here. We found a difference in the results derived from different codes. In, in Seagull results, it is relatively flat across all agent luminosity range, while in Cygnus, luminous, uh, luminous uh, agent, uh, atrox with agent luminous luminosity above 10 to the 13 are more likely to have smaller star formation rates. It's uh, currently, it's hard to claim which one is more accurate than the other. Uh, we, need more, we need more data in the longer wavelengths to decompose the contribution from AGN and the star formation activity. And, uh, and finally, this is a black hole growth rate to star formation rate ratio. And, uh, we find, uh, uh, although the Cygnus results scattered a lot and we didn't find any significant trends here, we, uh, we think we, uh, okay. uh, we think that it agrees with black hole growth, uh, black hole and host galaxy co-evolution, the constant uh, growth rate between black hole and the host galaxy. 
may, uh, could lead to a constant uh, uh, value, constant ratio of black hole mass and uh, host the, the bulge mass. And uh, here is the conclusions. I'll stop here and open for questions. Thank you. You are even early. That's very good. So, um, question from the audience. Maybe I'll start with uh, uh, just an easy question. I mean, so you, you started by saying the, the low far, you look at the low far image. So your source are all uh, uh, unresolved in low far. Do you see anything, any um, extension? They are uh, too high redshift, I guess, but. What do you mean extension? The morphology extension? Yeah, the morphology. I mean, the, the radio morphology. Do you see any anything or they are all uh, just unresolved like the one that you show here? Yeah, this is a uh, low for a six X second resolution. Mm. I think they are a relatively low resolution. They all look like this. And mm -hmm. we have some data with high re resolution, but it's not in our group. So it's, uh, it, it was led by a group in Leiden. So, um, I think in uh, our first paper, uh, there is some discussion about it. I can't remember exactly uh, about high resolution, high resolution images. Thank you. Any question, other question from, from the audience? Just from somebody that doesn't do, um, doesn't estimate uh, star formation and star formation rate. I thought it was quite tricky to disentangle the AGN part and uh, uh, star formation. So, um, I mean, you have a lot of uh, uh, data to put together, but um, is there anything that worries you about the, your um, estimate, given that they are AGN? Mm, one weakness of our analysis is that we derive galaxy, uh, we derive star formation rates and uh, AGN uh, luminosity from the same. Uh, from fitting the same multi wavelength data, so they are they are actually connected in some way. So uh, so you can imagine that uh, it is uh, it is uh, it is natural you get some some anti correlation like this because if you assign more uh, uh, more infrared luminosity due to AG and you will naturally get a smaller star formation rate. This is a um, uh, weakness of our study. Uh, usually, uh, not usually, a uh, widely adopted way to study the agent luminosity, uh, the correlation between agent luminosity and star formation rate is to derive these two, uh, two, two properties independently, uh, X-ray stacking, uh, whatever. So the uh, one weakness is our study that this, uh, this is some kind of degeneracy in, within these two to values, so it's kind of hard to, mm, mm, it's not, we cannot prove that uh, we find, we find uh, uh, evidence supports AGN quenching, we can, we only can say that we, our, uh, our results is, ag uh, agrees with AGN quenching phenomenon. Okay, thank you, that's, uh, yeah. I thought something similar, good. Any, any other question from, from the audience? If not, thank you again for your talk. Mm -hmm. And then we move on. So, so the next speaker is um, Sophie from Mierlo. And she's going to tell us about intermediate redshift contaminant in the search for um, Z above six galaxy nuclei. That's a long title. Thank you, Sophie, please. Yes, thank you very much, Rafaela. So um, could I, um, can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, 
So good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, let's say many thanks for this opportunity to present my work. And today I will talk about high redshift galaxies with Euclid and specifically cont contamination from intermediate redshift interlopers. Um, this work is, doing done, uh, is being done together with my supervisor, Karina Caputi at the Captain Institute. And it's uh, part of the Euclid uh, uh, Science Working Group in the primeval universe. So uh, let's do a little bit of uh, background on the Euclid. So um, as Karina already said, it's uh, soon to be launched in about two years. And uh, the primary mission uh, goal of Euclid is a full sky survey to investigate dark matter and constrain cosmological parameters. However, aside from this main wide survey, uh, there will be three Euclid deep fields uh, that will be very useful to the legacy science. So you can see them here. Uh, these three fields together span an area of about 40 square degrees on the sky. And uh, the telescope carries four filters, one wide optical band, the VIS band, and three near infrared bands. Um, and the expected five sigma depths in those bands are 27.3 in VIS and uh, 26 uh, in the near infrared bands. So it is pretty deep. And uh, well, for reference, the cosmos field, right, the, the legacy field, uh, the deepest parts are comparable to these, uh, to the near infrared Euclid depths. And th that field spans about one uh, a square degree. So we will um, gain very much data with the Euclid deep fields and expectedly uh, thousands of uh, Redshift 6 and beyond galaxies. Now to give a little bit of uh, background on the, the, like the core of this work is the contamination of galaxies at Redshift 6. Identifying these galaxies can be very challenging. Um, in the specific scenario of the Euclid telescope, it only carries four bands and uh, ancillary data in this huge survey area is scarce, uh, such that deriving photometric redshifts uh, may present difficult. Um, in addition, various sources of high redshift galaxy contamination have been identified over the years. For example, the black body spectra of cool brown dwarf stars produce uh, very similar uh, near infrared colors as uh, galaxies at redshift uh, 7. Um, another example of contamination are so-called extreme emission line galaxies, where a low redshift galaxy with very high equivalent with emission lights can mimic uh, the Lyman break of um, Redshift 6 galaxies and beyond. However, in this work, we focus specifically on the well-studied degeneracy between the H, dust, and the redshifts. In particular, uh, photometric uh, redshift codes are known to confuse the Lyman break with the 4000 Engstrom break. Uh, to illustrate this, I show here an example of where this happens. Uh, the Galaxy, the fiducial galaxy SED is displayed in red, so it's a galaxy at redshift 2.3. And then uh, with the minimum, uh, with the Euclid coverage in the optical and near infrared bands, the, um, this galaxy can be confused for a high redshift galaxy at redshift 8.5, because you can see that clearly this well developed 4000 Engstrom break uh, is confused for the Lyman break of a high redshift galaxy. So in this work, uh, we aimed to investigate the degree of contamination by intermediate redshift interlopers that we expect for high redshift galaxies uh, in the Euclid deep fields, and uh, specifically how the inclusion of ancillary data can reduce this contamination. And uh, in addition to quantifying the contamination, we also aim to determine criteria uh, to effectively separate the contaminants from the true high redshift galaxies. So in order to do this, we simulated Euclid-like Euclid sources from real galaxies between redshift 2 and 8 as observed in the cosmos. Uh, we used the Alter Vista and the SMUF source survey as a basis, and these span about 0.7 square degrees area in cosmos. Um, the catalog is based on photometry in 28 bands, including the latest Ultra Vista 
uh, data release, which re reaches similar depths to the, the, the Euclid deep fields. And um, we assume that the Ultra Vista 28 band photometric redshifts is our fiducial redshift because, well, we don't have spectroscopic redshifts for all these galaxies, uh, but 28 band uh, constraint uh, photometric redshift is pretty secure. Um, and the work is in total based on about 60,000 galaxies, uh, of which more than 300 uh, reside between redshift 6 and 8. So we have a decent high redshift uh, galaxy sample to do this. Um, then, using the uh, Ultra Vista Best Fit spectral energy, spectral energy distributions, we simulate photometry in the Euclid bands and also in the Rubin UGRIZ and the Spitzer uh, channel one and channel two of the IRIC instrument, uh, because well, we, sp uh, we chose these uh, observatories specifically uh, given their expected depths and also uh, extended coverage of the Euclid deep fields. Um, and then what we do once we have simulated this photometry, we rederive uh, the photometric redshift uh, based on various combinations of Euclid, Rubin and Spitzer data. So now on to the results of our work. Um, so here I show the fiducial redshift 28 bands, um, let's say true uh, redshift against the 11 bands simulated uh, redshift. So the Euclid, Rubin and Spitzer derived redshift. And as you can see, there is considerable scatter, but uh, let's say <laughs> at high redshifts, redshift six and beyond, it performs pretty well. So we are quite happy with this um, with this, uh, how we can can derive the photometric redshifts with Euclid. Um, as uh, just to be on the same page, um, the what we uh, what we define as uh, contaminants are galaxies that are at the uh, fiducial redshift between two and five point eight, and have a uh, observed with Euclid redshift bigger than six. So this is the the target sample. Now what we do is we uh, derive contamination fractions. Uh, so the percentage of intermediate redshift galaxies amongst the apparent Euclid observed high redshift sample. And we find that with Euclid alone, uh, this fraction is uh, more than 50%. So of all the high redshift galaxies you would find with Euclid, uh, more than 50% are in fact intermediate redshift interlopers which is definitely not ideal. Um, then we investigate how the inclusion of Rubin, Spitzer, uh, Rubin and Spitzer data can reduce this. And we find that uh, Rubin data is uh, highly successful in reducing this uh, contamination fraction. That is because these uh, bands effectively sample the limer break and therefore uh, Euclid plus Rubin data um, lifts the degeneracy between the Lyman break and the 4000 angstrom break. Now, Spitzer data is not so successful in uh, reducing this contamination fraction, but as we expect uh, the combination of all the bands, so the more data we have, uh, the better our photometric redshifts are. But the key point is that the Rubin data will be essential uh, for reducing intermediate redshift uh, contamination of these uh, true high redshift galaxies. Now, we are also interested in what these galaxies look like. Uh, in this plot, I show the median observed magnitude in the Rubin, Euclid, and Spitzer band <laughs> contaminants uh, in red, the true high redshift galaxies in blue, and uh, what we call stable intermediate redshift galaxies in um, brown. That's uh, stable, meaning that they are at uh, reduced redshifts between two and six, and also stay at these redshifts when you observe them with Euclid. Um, so it's clear uh, that the stable, uh, the, the contaminants in red make up uh, the faintest uh, sample of uh, galaxies between redshift two and six. But what is most important from this plot is uh, the uh, Euclid, Vis, and Y color of um, the true high redshift sources and the contaminants. So as you can see, um, the Euclid galaxies, uh, the, the, the true high redshift galaxies have much uh, brighter uh, Y uh, 
um, detections and therefore very different Euclid uh, vis minus y uh, vis minus y colors. Yes. So um, based on this plot, we thought, okay, we know this now. How can we separate these galaxies further? And we made uh, in order to do this the Two Euclid, minutes, uh, okay, thank you. The Euclid uh, uh, color selection criteria. So in this plot, you can see the vis minus y color against the y minus j color. And again, I indicate the um, two high redshift galaxies in blue and the contaminants in redshift, the contaminants in red. And as you can see, they are clearly separated in this color diagram. And we can reduce contamination by applying simple uh, Euclid color cuts, as you can see uh, by these two in this green box. So without any cuts in color, uh, the, co the contamination fraction uh, is about 30% in the best case scenario where we have um, Euclid, Rubin, and Spitzer data. And by applying this color uh, criteria, we can reduce this contamination to about 7%, effectively minimizing it. Um, so that is quite positive as a word, uh, word of caution, though. I should say that it only works in combination with the uh, with knowing the photometric redshifts. We found that we cannot select high redshift galaxies from Euclid scholars alone. So as a summary, um, I leave my points here. What we did is we, um, we investigated the contamination fraction of amongst high redshift galaxies with Euclid and found that Rubin data is essential in reducing this uh, contamination by intermediate redshift uh, interlopers and that by simple Euclid color uh, selection criteria, we can reduce it even more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, nice talk. Any question now? There is a clap and a question from Hank. Yeah, no, it, it's great to to see this. Um, I was wondering, because now you only focus on the photometry, I'm just wondering, have you looked also at the near infrared spectroscopy that will be there also for the whole area? And in particular, also in the deep fields, there will also be the blue grism from Euclid. Um, so so, would, so I don't know, maybe these galaxies are just too faint to, to see anything, but are you planning to explore it? I don't think we uh, are able to do it because, well, we simulate our galaxies from uh, an existing survey in Cosmos, and I believe that uh, the the we have redshifts, we have spectroscopic redshift for a couple sources at redshift five, but then it's kind of effectively stopped. So we cannot okay. really test this based on our data. But do you expect any emission lines? Well, I guess that's the only thing you would see there. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Maybe some of the outliers show an emission line or some of the candidates show emission lines. So well, we have. Just a, I, yeah, OK, it's interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I don't know uh, how. Neither do I. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, food for thought. Uh, Renia. Yeah. So I, I was wondering whether in this time of JWST, whether adding some JWST bands at, say, farther infrared would help? Um, I don't, I would say I don't think it would help very much because what we found, right, the, the, the Rubin data is so useful because it covers the optical uh, um, where the rest frame UV, so it covers the Lyman break. So you have this, like you lift this degeneracy between the Lyman break and the 4000 angstrom break and the JWST near infrared data. I think it will be similar as how useful Spitzer data is. It's, it's very, very essential for the stellar masses and other physical mm -hmm. parameters at these redshifts, but not so much for the photometric redshifts, I would say. Okay, yeah. Karina, you have a the question? No, I just wanted to make a quick comment following Hank's uh, suggestion. You were meaning to use the spectroscopic data in Euclid. And the problem is the spectroscopic data in Euclid will only catch bright Lyman alpha emitters at high redshift. And many of these contaminants are actually quite red in galaxies, either because they are pretty old for the age of the universe at that time or because they are dusty. So probably they are not, they don't fall in the 
very bright emission line galaxies. And even the, the high redshift galaxies could be many more, the real high redshift galaxies could be many more than bright Lyman alpha meters. So the grease, I mean, Euclid will only tell a part of the story. Okay, thank you. I just have a, a curiosity and then we, I think we should move on. Were you surprised that the Spitzer data are not so useful for your um, uh, decontamination, let's say? I mean, you, you, you seem to use, but they don't turn out to be so, so useful in a way. No, well, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I would say that Spitzer data is still very, very helpful because, well, this work focuses uh, on photometric redshifts, but uh, yeah, as I said, just to Rainier, any other parameter, any other physical parameter, if you don't constrain beyond the 4,000 angstrom break, your stellar masses are basically, um, uh, well, they're based on almost nothing. So we, we need Spitzer data to, to investigate the physical parameters of these galaxies. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you okay. very much. Thanks. Uh, let's move on then uh, to uh, Anna de Graaf. And she will tell us about probing the evolution of massive galaxies with the fundamental plane. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I guess Renier has his hand up, but it's still from the previous question. Okay. <laughs> all right. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here today. Um, so I'm Anna de Graaf. I'm a PhD student at Leiden Observatory. And today I'll talk about uh, recent work that I've done uh, with the Legacy Survey, looking at uh, the evolution of massive galaxies uh, using the fundamental plane. So I'll start. Oh yeah, if it yeah. Um, I'll start by. Um, we don't see your presentation. We see a black screen that says that you started screen sharing, but no slide. I don't know if this is. Can you see it now? Yeah. Now it's better. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, it paused. I didn't know it was okay. possible. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, there are many ways of looking at. Um, galaxy evolution from a statistical point of view. And here I'm just showing you some examples that you're probably already familiar with. Um, so we know from looking at galaxy stellar mass functions or luminosity functions that uh, galaxies grow in mass uh, with time and that this evolution is different for quiescent and star forming galaxies. And similarly, uh, when we look at the mass size relation, um, we also see that galaxies grow in size. So here on the right, you see at a fixed mass um, that uh, both star forming galaxies, the blue points and quiescent galaxies, the red points grow significantly uh, with time and that it is much more rapid for quiescent galaxies than star forming galaxies. Now, what I'm interested in is um, finding out a little bit more about the stellar populations, so how they evolve as well as structural properties. And the simplest way of doing this is by adding in a, a third parameter, and then you obtain uh, the so-called fundamental plane. So this is simply the scaling relation between uh, galaxy size, the kinematics through the velocity dispersion and the surface brightness. And um, here you see how um, early type galaxies, so local ellipticals are uh, distributed in this parameter space. And you see they trace out this very tight uh, planar scaling relation. Um, now, traditionally, this was used as a distance indicator, which is a rather boring application. Um, but people quickly found out that you can actually do science with this as well and learn something about uh, the way galaxies evolve. So uh, concretely, uh, what does that mean? Well, for instance, if we look at the face-on view of the plane, so here you're looking at different slices through it, we see that um, there are clear correlations with different galaxy properties along the plane. So here you're seeing that there's a clear age gradient across the plane and also through it. And um, this is not just the case for age, but we see the same with, uh, for instance, metallicity or alpha enhancement. And uh, this really puts strong constraints on our galaxy formation models. Now, this is all at low redshift, just from Sloan. Um, but if we move to higher redshift, we also see that the plane itself evolves. So here you see um, an edge on view of the uh, fundamental plane. So you see this very tight sequence here at redshift zero. 
And this is all for uh, early type galaxies. And um, as you move towards higher redshift, you see that the sequence uh, moves down in this plot. And what this means is that uh, the mass to light ratio um, evolves for these galaxies. And that can evolve uh, either because of uh, differences in stellar populations or structural properties. Um, well, what you also see is that the number of data points towards high redshift become extremely sparse. And that is uh, simply because measuring stellar kinematics beyond redshift zero is just very hard. Um, so, so far, studies really have been limited to samples of roughly 100 galaxies. And these are often really biased towards uh, highly uh, dense environments or just really bright objects like post Star Wars galaxies. So what we'd like to know is how this plane evolves for a more representative sample of galaxies and then see what we can learn. And this is where the legacy survey comes in. Um, so this is a very deep spectroscopic survey um, of massive galaxies in the cosmos field. Uh, this was conducted with BIMOS on VLT right before it was decommissioned. And um, it targets about 3,000 uh, massive galaxies at a redshift of about one. So it's a look back time of around seven giga years. And uh, this survey is K-band selected. So it means you have no bias towards certain colors or morphologies. You're really probing a wide range of uh, galaxy types and also environments. Um, and here you see just some example spectra. So you see all these very beautiful high signal to noise absorption features. Uh, and from these features, among many things, we get um, um, very accurate uh, velocity dispersion. So, uh, kinematics for these galaxies. And being in the cosmos field, we have lots of ancillary data as well. So uh, we can measure galaxy morphologies uh, from HSC imaging and just from multi-wavelength photometry, um, we get, um, we can do SED modeling, uh, like some feed is right, and um, uh, estimate stellar masses, for instance. So we have a huge amount of data. Um, so what do we see? Well, we can start by just showing uh, an edge-on view of the fundamental plane. So the left-hand side here is really the traditional view. And what you see is that quiescent galaxies at the about one also trace this very tight sequence. So they also lie on this very tight fundamental plane. Um, now what's interesting is if we move to star-forming sample as well, you see that they also trace a similar sequence, but with a slightly different zero point and just a much larger scatter. So we can ask, how does this evolve with redshift? Um, and the answer is it's very strong. So here you see um, how the zero point of the plane changes uh, with time. And the zero point is directly proportional to the mass to light ratio. So that's why the y-axis here is uh, M over L. And uh, so what you see is that uh, the mass to light ratio decreases uh, towards higher redshift. So it just means that the fixed mass galaxies and high redshift are brighter. Um, especially here in a G band. Um, and this can have many different causes, but an obvious one is, of course, that galaxies are younger at higher redshift, so they just have uh, younger stellar populations that are simply very bright um, at short wavelengths. Um, but another possibility is that there is significant structural evolution. So you would like to somehow differentiate between these two. So how do we do this? Well, we can go back to the previous and um, rather than uh, looking at the relation between so size, uh, velocity dispersion and surface brightness, uh, replace the surface brightness by a stellar mass surface density. So using a stellar mass estimated from SED modeling. And then you obtain a so-called stellar mass fundamental plane. And this is interesting uh, because when you do this, you find that all galaxies lie on the same uh, stellar mass plane. And when I say the same, it's not just in terms of the zero point, uh, but also the scatter uh, about this plane is approximately equal uh, for these two populations of galaxies. Um, so despite very strong variation in properties like star formation rate or dust or structural properties, uh, galaxies form a unimodal distribution in this parameter space. Uh, another way of looking at this is by um, looking at the scatter about the plane um, different wavelengths. So you see for a G-band, there is clearly a uh, very strong, a uh, very large scatter, and this is very strongly uh, dependent on whether it's quiescent or star forming. And as you go towards longer wavelengths, you see that the scatter uh, decreases. So the effect of stellar populations essentially um, 
becomes smaller, uh, if there's less uh, variance. Uh, but only when you move towards the star mass plane, um, you actually find that the scatter is lowest, but also that um, it is roughly similar for uh, question the star forming galaxies. So we can then ask, how does this evolve uh, with redshift? And the answer is that it really doesn't. Um, so again, I'm showing here the zero point of the plane um, across redshift. But now the zero point is proportional to the dynamical to stellar mass ratio rather than the mass to light ratio. And uh, what you see is that this is basically flat. Um, bar some systematic uncertainties between the Sloan and legacy surveys. Um, so what does this mean? Well, um, most practically it means that for a galaxy of a given size and a given velocity dispersion um, it has the same stellar mass at the register of one as it does at the register of zero. Um, so this is for, as a population. So of course an individual galaxy can grow in mass and therefore change in size, etc. But um, in some sense, galaxies at the register of one are not structurally very different from those at the register of zero. So we find that all these massive galaxies lie on the same scaling relation between redshift zero and one, uh, which means that they're confined to a very narrow range in parameter space across this huge um, range in time. And um, this also means that progenitor and descendant galaxies lie on the same scaling relation. And that has pretty strong implications uh, because it means that, for example, uh, quenching or any growth in size uh, must be uh, is confined to this space. So if it, something grows in size, it must be accompanied by a change in the kinematics or the stellar mass such as to stay on this plane. And simply this fact also means that we could actually in future um, use the fundamental plane as a tool to uh, statistically track um, galaxies across cosmic time and um, learn about uh, the average growth, for instance, in size or the average change in uh, dynamics. But there are some caveats to this, so there's more to come for me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Juana. Perfect time. So, um, okay, question. I see Scott and Filippo uh, and Kungua. Okay, Scott. Um, uh, Filippo was first, I'll let him go first, actually. Okay, then Philippe. Thank you, Scott. So uh, maybe I missed, but uh, when you look at uh, um, the star forming galaxies, those are disks. And when you, so when you measure the, the velocity dispersion, uh, I, I suspect you are effectively measuring the rotation, of some, yeah, yeah. So uh, some relation to the rotation. So, um, Maybe that projection is sort is something similar to a Tally Fisher for uh, for the star forming galaxies, and it, uh, in some sense you are finding that the something like a Tally Fisher doesn't evolve with, with the redshift up to redshift one. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. Um, so of course the main difference is that Tally Fisher is explicitly independent of surface brightness. Um, but um, yeah, as you say, these dispersions, they are integrated velocity dispersions. So they really, they contain a rotational component as well. So it's really more a measure of the energy of the system rather than a dispersion of the system. Um, the link to Tully Fisher is a good one. It's actually not very well known. So how these two um, relate to each other. It's probably a difference in aperture between Tully Fisher and fundamental plane. So for Tully Fisher, you go out way further um, to measure the rotation curve, of course, and get the circular velocity. Um, whereas fundamental plane is really at RE. Um, so that's why you have this at RE, it is dependent on surface brightness, whereas further out, it uh, might not be. Okay, thanks. Okay, Scott. Great stuff, Anna. It's very impressive. Um, do you expect this to break down at higher redshift? Because I would have thought for early type galaxies that this would start breaking down once you got to the sort of redshift to extremely compact phase. Uh, that's a good question. So yeah, Rachel Bazanson looked at this um, for some post-star versus redshift 2. It's also Jessup on his work. Um, and they find 
that they yeah, roughly lie on the same plane, but there are some caveats there that they use very different stellar population modeling. Um, so it's actually hard to say, I haven't looked at their sample, uh, but it's definitely one of the things that we want to look into as well once we get kinematics from JWST, even though it will be gas, but um, to see where this breaks down and when galaxies actually settle on uh, a scaling relation like this. Thanks. Okay, we have one more question from Kuhn. Hi, Anna, great work, very fundamental stuff. Um, so the, on your second bullet, can you say a bit more about what this really implies, for example, if I merge two disks, are they expected to stay on the scaling relation you find, or if I merge two ellipticals or an elliptical disk? Yeah, so, that's, yeah. Um, so if you have two disks that collide, um, they were on this relation before, and the descendant will also be there. Um, now, of course, during the actual merger phase, it might not be, but that's because things get messy and yeah, the quantity of dispersion doesn't have much meaning anymore than anyway. Um, but that is the striking part is that, um, yeah, so the descendant, I don't know, could be elliptical, for instance, um, is then still there. Um, so that constrains really the path that it can take uh, as well. So, so can you can you give an example of some path which is excluded by your findings? That's a good question. It's something <laughs> I'm looking into right now, actually, with uh, some simulations, because then you can track it through time and see, uh, yeah, what happens. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we should stop here because we are slightly late, but I think there was a nice discussion for every talk. So I, it's always. Uh, Good to see this. So we reconvene, the, well, first of all, thanks to all the speakers so far, and um, we reconvene at four, or should we do five past four? I don't know. The next chair is Scott, so i leave it to him to... I'll ask Rainier. <laughs> no, okay. it's, it's up we, to you. It's we reconvene at four, so it would be a short tea or coffee. A very yeah. short tea or coffee. <laughs> four o'clock. Uh, uh, Scott or, or, or Renier, I'm having some problems with uh, with Zoom and taking into account that I'm speaking next, can I try to share my screen just in case that uh, there is something wrong or... Ask, uh, ask Petra, yes. yeah. Yes. So, so can, I, can I try to see if... Uh... Try, try sharing your screen. Okay, so it, it's just because, I don't know, it was something something weird because when people started sharing, my, my screen went completely black. <laughs> So I was not sure if, uh, so can you see this? No, nothing yet. Nothing. So in principle, this is weird because in principle I'm sharing my, my screen now. Um, so, so I don't know if, maybe, if, maybe. if I start my video, you see it, right? Well, I mean, try something. I don't, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. I'm going to stop sharing again, but... <laughs> But, but in principle, I, I'm sharing, I don't know. So I would try leaving and then rejoining. It looks like yeah. this is a problem. I have done that like every time that a speaker starts speaking because otherwise everything is black. So I, I leave the meeting and then I join again. So Thomas, is that you? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> so it's really strange because oh, I see there is a, you're, you're muted at the moment. So maybe there is something wrong, uh, wrong with the current connection that you have or Zoom that you have. So in principle, Just, I'm As moving. Joe suggested, I think if you... Worst case scenario, maybe you can send me the presentation. 
you know? yeah, well, I, I have already sent the presentation to, to Amina, but uh, yeah, that, that could be another option. I mean, if, if, you, if you can hear me, maybe another person can share the, the, their screen and, and that's it. Yeah. Even more strangely, I can hear you, but I don't see that you're actually logged in. Ah, oh, really? <laughs> I don't, I, <laughs> in principle, I'm here. I don't know. I, I, I have even tried restarting the computer. No, no, you're, you're here. I, I see you here. You're well, now I see you, but I see that you're muted, which is very strange. But this, yeah. is, this is what maybe, Tamar was saying, yeah? Can you maybe try <laughs> some other browser? If you have, just log in through some other browser. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm going yeah. to try that. Let's see if I yeah. can do it uh, in these four minutes. <laughs> the, final, the final possibility, Tomas, is to, is to make sure that you have updated um, Zoom to the latest version on your machine. Because that's often a problem these days. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm going. I'm going to to check that as well. Okay. Thank you. So now I'm going to disconnect to see if, <laughs> if I can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm. He's still there, though. I can still see him as locked on. Yeah, that is very strange. Are you back? I'm trying now a different browser. So because in principle I'm using my soon is updated. So so I don't know. I see you now, which I didn't before. Try okay. Sharing, so I'm going to try to share. So yes. let's see. If yes. I... Yes, it works. Okay. 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 I, I I don't even know what is my presentation now, but okay, it's here. So <laughs> so. Okay, in principle, you're seeing it full screen and everything. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, how relief I feel now. Okay, yeah, you're <laughs> thank you so much for your help. <laughs> Xiaoyan. Hey. Hi, Xiaoyuan, can you yeah. can you um also share your screen right now? Make sure it works. Okay, let me have a try. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah, I see your presenter view though. Oh, ah. so yeah. I need a timer, but <laughs> so maybe I need just not using the present view.
this time. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. We'll just leave it there and we'll just yeah, yeah. we'll just sure. start here. And I'll give it one more minute for people to come back. It was too short of a break, so I'll just give people one more minute. All right, I think we can start again. Um, I want to thank Raffaella for chairing the previous session um, and all the speakers who, who spoke already for giving great talks. I really enjoyed it. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of this session as much as, as you did the first half. Um, please remember that you can always ask questions on the Slack channel for um, uh, the Slack channel is day two Nova NW1. Um, please do use it um, because the speakers are actually using it as well. Um, and if you're a speaker and haven't uh, yet connected to the Slack, please do so. So people can ask you questions there. So we're going to start now with uh, Xiaoyan Zhang from Leiden Observatory in Esron, who's going to tell us about galaxy uh, majors. Hang on, let me close my office door. <laughs> Sorry. All right, I'll keep talking for a second. Uh, he's going to tell us about Deep Chandra observations of the double relic cluster. Uh, Zwicky 2341 plus double zero, double zero. Take it I'm away, back. If you want to go. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Xiao Yuan from Leiden Observatory, and as long as I'm a third year PhD student. Today, uh, first, I would like to thank the committee giving me the opportunity to present my recent work. It's about the Chandra observation of the double relic cluster 2341. First, let me briefly introduce the uh, background of galaxy cluster mergers. So here on the left, there's a movie of simulation of bullet cluster and uh, observed beautiful image from Chandra. Uh, in that beautiful image, we can see at least there are two uh, surface brightness discontinuities. They have similar properties in terms of surface brightness, but in the temperature profile, they are totally different. The first discontinuity, which is the boundary of the bullet, is a cold front, where the pressure holds equilibrium across that one. And the second one, which is the outer one, is the shock front driven by the supersonic motion of the bullet. The shock compressed the gas and heated the gas. So in that case, the post-shock gas temperature pressure and density is higher than the pre-shock region. So the galaxy cluster merger offers opportunity to study uh, plasma physics in multiple aspects like equipartition time scales, thermal conductivity, viscosity, and instability. Not only for uh, those thermal properties, the shocks can also accelerate cosmic rays, which is responsible to produce uh, one radio, diffuse radio source in galaxy cluster that is radio relic. Uh, here's a textbook example, which is sausage cluster. It's a famous radio relic. Here we can see uh, in the spectral index map, the radio relic shows spectral steepening towards the center of the uh, cluster, which is caused by the uh, cooling of synchrotron and the inverse Compton. Uh, and from the X-ray side to confirm it, this uh, is a shock, we usually use a temperature measurement. We measure temperature behind the relic and in front of the relic. Here, here we see an example. Here we see the temperature jumps from above 8 kV to 3 kV. And in some of the uh, galaxy clusters, there are pairs of radio relics beside the cluster. Uh, we call them double relic cluster. These are a, a good example because they usually have a simple merger scenario, usually in a binary merger and uh, the, or, and a hand on merger. And uh, the merging axis is very close to the plane of sky. Therefore, they suffer less from the projection effects 
and uh, it's good for us to study the radio relic shock connections. Here, the opt we are studying is also a double relic cluster. So like other uh, cluster hosting radio relics, people investigated the connection between the shocks and the relic. Here, the, in the southern relic, uh, a surface brightness discontinuity were found, and it is likely to be the shock that is responsible for the southern relic. However, a span of that discontinuity uh, in the right panel is shorter than the whole radio relic region. So it could be an exception, exception of the shock relic association. Uh, to investigate that mystery, uh, the deep Chandra observation, observations were proposed. Uh, using that deep observation, we are able to we are able to map the thermodynamics properties for the whole cluster. And this is the temperature map. From the temperature map, we can see outside this uh, discontinuity, the temperature seems to be higher than the inside. And also from the entropy map, the entropy inside is smaller. So the lower entropy uh, usually are the core remnants of the subcluster. So it could be a cold front. Then we extract both the surface brightness and the temperature profiles uh, across that jump. And we see, uh, we confirm it is a cold front. So it's not a shock front. So this is, it's not a mystery. And one thing we need to say is that temperature measurement is very important to confirm it is a shock front. And then the question is, where is the shock front that is responsible for the Southern Relic? So uh, the initial speculation is it could be the outer edge of the radio relic. So to confirm this, we compute spectral index map using GMRT and the JVLA radio observations. This is the first time we uh, show the spectral flattening at the edge of the, this radio relic. And uh, the Mach number of that, that shock is, can be uh, calculated using the injected spectral index, just at the spectral in the, at the edge of the relic. It is about 2.2. Similarly, uh, for the northern radio relic, uh, we see the spectrum, uh, radio spectrum is flat at the edge, and uh, we also uh, extract the surface brightness profile in X-ray. Uh, this time we see similar, there's a, there's a jump here. Uh, however, the number of total counts is too small to let us get an exact value of that jump. But however, uh, nevertheless, we can uh, estimate the shock Mach number using the radio injected spectral index. Besides that, uh, the radio relic and shock connection, this deep observation uh, reveals a new feature that has never been observed in merging galaxy cluster. That is a cone-shaped supercluster. So it's almost a perfect cone shape. We extract a surface brightness profile in the azimuthal way here at the at of 154 degree, and the, the jump is so sharp. Here, the jump width is smaller than the mean free pass of the gas here. So it stressed the, uh, it stressed that the, the, fuse, uh, the fusion has been, has been uh, reduced. And also, because this feature is so rare, the conic supercluster is so rare, we look up uh, the similar properties in the simulation. Here, we found one in a one, two, three mass ratio merger. And uh, in that simulation, create a similar structure here, the comparison. Also, there's another work conducted by the John et al. in, nine, uh, in 2019, and uh, they, uh, 
simulate the, the evolution of the code front when it passed through the main cluster. So here we can see most of the, we up, the code front we observe in merging galaxy clusters are in the green stage, like these examples. And the, the cluster we observe is in a transition stage between a green and uh, Magenta. And the, the last case, about 168, some part of the gas inside the cone is still moving out and expanded in the outskirts. There's also a special case and the, in about 168, uh, both side of the cone has still been kept. Therefore, we can build a merger code from a sequence and we have all candidates of the uh, or candidates of the uh, code front at different stages. Besides, we also have a new mystery here in the temperature region. It's a hot region, hot temperature region four. And around that hot temperature region four, we observe two surface brightness deficit bays. And we are not sure which bay contributes the hot temperature. And then we extract the surface brightness and temperature profile along this slit. So start from the north uh, western. Here we can see the temperature in the northern bay is low, but in the southern bay is high and it's even higher uh, in the region between those two bays. Therefore, as a product of uh, density and the temperature, the pressure doesn't hold equilibrium across the bay and the ridge between those two bays. So here is a pressure. Two minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. The last slide, yeah. So here is the region where the uh, pressure doesn't hold equilibrium. So it's a new mystery and a new feature. We don't know uh, how it is produced and uh, we don't find any radio counterparts uh, in the radio image. So here's my a brief summary. So if you have questions, you can, we have, yeah, we have two minutes, right? <laughs> we have three minutes actually. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, thanks very much. Um, are there questions for this interesting talk? So maybe I can ask a question. Oh, sorry, I did hear a question. Go ahead. Okay, so sorry, I was not finding the, the raise hand. But, uh, hi. So my talk. So uh, in the slide where you showed these uh, cold front sequence, uh, you uh -huh. had reported the, the bullet cluster. So I, won I was wondering what, what is uh, the bullet uh, cluster in these? Uh... Uh, the bullet cluster, I think is still in the, in the green stage. But you know, some of the cluster, it depends on the configuration of each subcluster and the environment of the main cluster, you know, and the mass ratio can also can play a role in shaping the code front. And uh, I, I haven't understood if uh, the Zwicky case uh, is in a later or in an earlier phase with respect to, to the bullet. Uh, I think it's a later phase than bullet. Okay. Because the bullet, the code front still a blunt body. It's not a sharp cone. Okay, thank you. More questions? I have a quick question on this slide, actually. Mm -hmm. This is just great. It, is, there a, is there a viewing angle effect? In the sense um, that if you look at a, a, mm -hmm. a cluster there in the wrong could, way, will yeah, you yeah. not actually see it? There could be a viewing angle, like uh, about 665. I think the viewing angle is slightly higher than others. And the most of them, they are double relic clusters. So double relic clusters, they almost have a small view angle. Okay, great. Thanks, Xiaoyan. I think we need to move on. Um, the next talk is from Georg Wilding from Kapdein. Georg, are you ready to share your slides? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll give you a two minute warning. Yes, thank you very much. So just give me a second. 
Uh, you should be able to see the... Yes. And not the presentation view, I hope. Okay, perfect. Good. So thank you very much, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Um, I'm a PhD student at Kaptein. Uh, my supervisor at uh, Kaptein is Rien van der Weichard, and I have two other supervisors who are more on the mathematics side. And the project is also situated at the DSSC, which is kind of an interdisciplinary institute uh, concerned with, this, with data science and systems complexity. And what we are working on is to classify and to describe the cosmic web in terms of persistent homology, and in particular, basically looking at the hierarchical topology at, for now, in LCDM cosmologies, but we're aiming to go for a, basically, differentiation of dark energy, as well as to um, also look at <clears throat> halo structures, etc. So first of all, very briefly, a bit about the dark web, uh, the, the cosmic web. So essentially, it's a very anisotropic structure. It has a really interesting hierarchy where um, smaller structures converge and connect up into ever larger structures. This gives it essentially a geometrical asymmetry between the large, very empty voids and the very small, compact, high-density clusters. And the fourth part here is the, uh, the connectivity. And this is also what is very relevant if we want to look at this cosmic web from a perspective of topology, because connectivity is essentially um, the, the uh, attribute that gives this the, the interesting network structure. Um, so uh, like I said before, the cosmic web is a very complex structure. I'm showing here how this structure emerges in slices that um, in slices through the simulation that I'm analyzing. And you see very nicely here that you have a hierarchical evolution which then evolves into a multi-scale, almost fractal-like structure where they have then very small components that form larger and larger uh, filaments, as you can see here. Um, and this makes it essentially perfect for using something called topological data analysis, which focuses exactly on this connectivity, it focuses on structural hierarchy by essentially not working on the object itself, but using the connectivity of objects. It uses, uses neighborhood of objects to es essentially um, classify it and quantify it. So I've put here a, a few things that are important in our analysis. So connectivity, I said already, the neighborhood, I said already. What's also very important is the shape, essentially. So um, the, the advantage of using topology is that things are essentially conserved under the formation. Their shape should remain the same roughly. So if you have a void somewhere, if you deform your structure, it should not change too much. So in the context of the cosmic web, this can be of advantages if we're moving between real space and redshift space where we then have um, perturbations and deformations. Um, my group has been working on this since like almost 10, year already, 10, 10 years already. And this is like a quite interesting overview paper of uh, setting the groundwork for that. So maybe a bit more on the topology side here. So essentially what we do is we focus on topological features instead of uh, real features. And you can imagine topological features, something that like what I've put here on the right side. So if you imagine a torus or a torus surface, essentially uh, topological features would essentially concern independent um, closed loops, for example. So the green loop here and the red loop here around would be two independent topological features. Uh, other topological features would involve connected components, essentially. So these would have a dimension of zero uh, or, or voids, essentially, which would be classified as two-dimensional features because of the two-dimensional shell that encloses them. And what essentially we do is that we look for groups of independent features and the number of these independent features gives something that's called the Betty number. So this essentially gives you a number of, for example, the number of voids, of independent voids you have in your structures, or the number of filamentary loops that you have in your structures. Um, and very important is the concept of persistence and the relation that it has to the hierarchy we have in our data sets. Um, and with hierarchy, I mean, what, um, like in what way the different parts of the structure connect up and form one connected part. 
Um, this is analyzed by using something called filtrations, where essentially you look for you look at everything above a certain threshold density, for example. This is then referred to as a super level set. And you can see here going from left to right what happens if you decrease the threshold and you increase and you include more and more parts of your structures in your uh, in your complex. And then you essentially look for these topological components in these um, connected structures. Um, you can then look at how the connectivity changes. Imagine this left side here as kind of a um, map with mountain peaks here and these contour lines as um, height lines, as contour lines as they are. Then you can essentially determine from this um, topology tree, as it's called, how many um, distinct components you have, for example, at one specific, specific density uh, threshold. Just to have a very quick um, impression of what this is. Um, instead of using densities, you, call, you can also some, use something called uh, the distance fields, where you essentially connect different points or particles, for example, from simulations, depending on the distance they have between, uh, between them which then leads to something um, like what you see here on the right side, where you have points connected uh, with a specific distance. And then if you increase this distance, which means the circle grows larger, other points will be connected and you will form a loop here, for example, which is not present here. Then the important notion here is that uh, at specific density values or distances, um, features will be created and features will disappear. This is then referred to the birth and the death of these features. And this is in particular the birth and the death of topological features. So at one particular uh, radius of these um, circles here, this loop here will form. And if we increase the uh, radius of these circles at one point, the whole loop will be filled up. So the birth and the death are essentially two characterizing densities. If we return to the density fields of specific features and uh, classes of structures, so to speak, um, in our um, simulations at this point. Um, you can then arrange them in something called persistence diagrams, where you essentially just plot the birth versus the death of these features. You can then average, so to speak, over these um, persistence diagrams to get a one-dimensional summary curve, which kind of characterizes characteristic densities you have in your structures. And this is how this looks if you actually use uh, simulations to trace the topological features there. So in the top part, you have three panels going from low, from high redshift to low redshift. You can see how a structure forms. And in the bottom panels, I'm showing the right part, for example, the Betty curves. So the number of distinct two-dimensional so void components and how this changes from high redshift to low redshift here on the left. And you can, for example, see that the height of the curve decreases, which means that the number of distinct voids will decrease. Um, you can also see that it shifts to the left. So it goes to lower densities, which means that the density within voids decreases. And this is basically a natural representation of voids merging to larger and fewer voids, as well as to matter moving out of the void center into the surrounding walls. Um, what we are doing essentially is we characterize, we quantify these curves using a skew normal distribution with a few parameters that then trace the evolution of structure and that are very easy to quantify and also to use between different duck energy models, for example. There's much more information in the persistence diagrams, um, but we go into more detail there on the paper. I don't think I have that much time to do that here in this talk. Um, same for this slide, I think. But essentially, a quick way of um, imagining the importance of persistence diagrams is that they give more information on how uh, structures evolve, for example. So the bottom panels here show how the um, void diagram shifts, essentially, if you go from high redshifts to low redshifts. You can see that it also moves to, to lower, densities, <clears throat> lower densities here. And you can basically separate the evolution of different uh, structural components of the cosmic web here. Um, I said before that we also want to do basically dark energy differentiation. And what we try to do is we try to see how the connectivity changes between different topological, different cosmological models. Uh, for example, this part is connected here in LCDM um, in the SUGA model, which is 
basically a quintessence model where you have yeah, a scalar field to describe dark energy and supergravity, these parts are disconnected. Um, this minutes, is to a, sure. thank you. This is to a part related that um, in within these models, sigma eight, so the number, so the um, the clustering on scales of eight megaparsecs is slightly different, but we can correct for that. And then using the parameters that I was describing before for the, the Betty curves, we can still find differences. So the three curves here illustrate the parameter for a particular um, cosmological model with the error bars determined from three, five separate runs. And you can see that for um, specific ranges of sigma eight, you can still very nicely tell apart in which model your structure should be. So we can detect differences. We can do it in simulations, essentially. We want to do this in uh, observations as well. So the first step into this direction is that we are analyzing the topology of dark matter halos, where we essentially look at how halos of different masses connect up um, and form structures. So these are essentially voids outlined by dark matter halos. Um, I think I will skip this. We then essentially correct for clustering um, according to the two-point correlation function. And we then basically look at um, relevant structures in the persistence diagrams, and we see how this correlates with halo mass, essentially. And a very quick takeaway from this plot here would be that um, the clustering length is essentially related to the mass of the halo. The two different slopes here are essentially the relation to components or to features of different dimension. So depending on the halo mass, you have a different relation to um, a different com component of the cosmic web, whether it's a filament, then it would be more related to the uh, one-dimensional curve here, or it's related to a wall or a void, then it's the gray curve here. And like I said, we aim to go for observations at some point. At the moment, it's only simulations, but we hope to do something on um, more interesting observations at some point and basically use this to do cosmological differentiation. Other people are already using it to um, constrain parameters. And the advantage is that you basically have um, not only local, but also global information. So for example, gaps like this, they would not matter that much if you're focusing on the structural buildup. Um, yes, thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions you have. Thanks, Jörg. Um, really interesting stuff. Are there questions from the audience? Peter. Yeah, sure, why not? I, I recently saw in the literature uh, a mention that there's a relationship in the structure, in the neurons, in the, in I don't know what brain, human brains, whatever, and um, logical structure in, in, in the sense that you're talking about. Um, I looked at the figures and I didn't see it. I'm wondering if you had seen these papers that describing that, is there really something true and useful in this analysis? So I think I know the paper you're referring to. If I remember correctly, it was rats brains. And uh, yeah. so the, um, maybe recently they have also done it in human brains. So I think the interesting part here is that, um, I mean, if you look at this picture here of the cosmic web, if you imagine that this is neurons and they're kind of connected in um, with like nerve cells, then I think the important part here is that you have kind of a structural connectivity. And if you remember from the paper, they were saying that you have maybe nine or 10 dimensional spaces in these clusters of, uh, of neurons. So I think the important part is that they're trying to do a dimensionality and to find the dimensionality of graphs here. So I think you can do interesting things. And um, like I'm only working in 3D, so I can't say that much on how, like, how good it actually works in that high dimensions. All right, thanks. Um, there's a message in the Slack channel, which I'll just read out um, <clears throat> from Romka Bontuku which says, can you observe a kind of phase transition in the birth death rates as a function of redshift? So we can see kind of a phase transition, which this was actually one of the slides I was skipping. I think it's a bit slow now. 
but yes, so you kind of see a specific density range where quite suddenly you form a large part of the connections. So this is what you see kind of here in these sharp demarcation lines in this roughly triangular region. So if you interpret this as essentially a border between a region where you have fewer connections of that particular dimension and the border in a region where you have more of these connections, then um, you have an appearance essentially of the filamentary structure over, over quite narrow density ranges. And then if you go to even lower densities, then this quite suddenly disappears. So there seems to be something like a, a phase transition, yes. Thanks. Um, given the time, I'm going to have to move on. Um, but please do ask questions in the Slack channel. I don't know if you're, you're in the Slack channel, but maybe you should connect yourself. Yes, yeah, so um, OK. Okay. Thanks a lot. And then, um, thanks very much. And then I'll move on to um, to uh, Akshara. Are you ready to? Uh... Yes. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Can you turn on the the presentation? Yeah. Yeah, OK. I think that we see what we need to see. So um, please take it away. I'll give you a two minute warning. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshara Vishwanathan, and I'm studying the metallicity distribution of the Milky Way halo. And um, I'm working with uh, Elsie Stockenberg uh, and Chris Joachim in the Pristine Collaboration, and uh, Professor Mina Helmi, uh, Helma Koppen, and uh, her team in Captain. Uh, because I started my PhD in, uh, in the era of remote working, I'm going to give credit to Zoom as well. So moving on, uh, this is an overview of what I will be talking about in this presentation for the next 11 and a half minutes. Um, so it starts from uh, why, why do we want to study the Milky Way halo uh, and a little bit about the pristine survey and what we do there and about my sample, how we select the halo stars and cross match them with the pristine photometric metallicities and few results um, regarding the thick disk contribution and the metallicity distribution across various distances and lines of sight and some of the ongoing work regarding the substructures in my sample. So I would like to call myself a galactic archeologist because we look uh, for fossils in the sky and it helps us to study the biography of the Milky Way. Uh, so here we use stars as the direct traces of uh, early universe. So stars, uh, I like to call them the time machines. Um, so most of the oldest or metal poor stars inform us about the early star formation. They help us to test the theoretical predictions of the first stars and they help us to study the assembly of the galaxies and uh, they are basically a uh, local equivalent of the high redshift universe. So um, in, in stellar archeology, span as you travel back in time, we're going to like decreasing metal cities. Um, so it, the basic ingredients of the first stars are light elements and some traces of lithium. And um, the basic ingredients of sun-like stars are uh, hydrogen, helium, and some amount of metals. So for the metallicity of stars, we use the logarithmic metallicity scale of iron over hydrogen. Uh, and we use the solar metallicity as the reference scale. So sun is at zero. And so this end from the metal poor stars to solar to solar uh, to super metal rich stars, uh, there are 99% of the stars in the Milky Way and they're mostly in the distant bulge. Uh, and there is the rare, uh, rare remnants of the first stars where only 40 stars are known um, up until the mega metal poor stars. Uh, and then comes the part that I'm interested in. Uh, so the stars that are from metal poor stars to uh, extremely metal poor end. So this, uh, this, these stars are mostly found in the halo. And yeah, so why do we want to study the halo? Uh, because they, because they say about the accretion events from the past, like the Gaia and Slatus events, and the halo consists of most of the metal poor stars, as I said earlier. So uh, why is it difficult to study the uh, Milky Way halo? Because uh, most of the stars are distant and scarce. And uh, um, at those distances, the Gaia parallax is poor. And uh, we are looking at the halo from a vantage point in the disk. 
So uh, in this uh, research, we use the reduced promotion uh, selection method for the halo main sequence stars. Uh, we select main sequence stars because they have simpler absolute magnitude color relations, so they can be used to uh, estimate reliable photometric distances. And uh, we select uh, the halo stars using uh, the reduced proper motion parameter, which is dependent on the proper motion and photometry. So this is the reduced proper motion diagram, uh, RPM versus the color, uh, where we place a high tangential velocity cut uh, to select the halo stars. And this is the formula for reduced proper motion. So we basically select the main sequence stars in a certain color region and uh, place them in the reduced proper motion diagram and select the high tangential velocity stars because uh, they would mostly be the halo stars. So the advantages of using the selection is this is a distance independent way of selecting the halo main sequence stars. And main sequence stars are usually numerous in number uh, in the halo. And these can also be, uh, this method can also be used to reliably estimate photometric distances. So in the reliable color cut range, uh, the typical distance uncertainty is down to 7% in the sample. So this uh, catalog was initially produced for Gaia DR2. Uh, so in DR2, we had 11 million stars. And uh, when Gaia EDR3 came out, we uh, reproduced the catalog and uh, voila, we have 47 million stars. Uh, so more stars, more, uh, more science to do. So uh, I will quickly go through um, go through how we uh, study the metal core stars in the pristine survey in general. So pristine uh, survey is a narrow band CHK survey in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and we have uh, more than 6,800 degrees square coverage of the sky and it's still growing. Um, this is using the CHK filter, which is very metal sen metallicity sensitive as we can see from the first figure. And the second figure is a comparison of the uh, pristine photometric metallicities versus the existing spectroscopy ones. Uh, this is an international team, and we uh, we study the inner galaxy, the um, dwarf galaxies. Um, we, uh, the pristine survey is also useful in selection of the BHB stars. We study the disk, the bulge, uh, and also the halo. So uh, circling back to the RPM sample that I started with, uh, I initially cross-matched them with the existing spectroscopic surveys, and we can see the cross-match numbers from the table. And then I cross-matched them with the pristine um, survey, and we have a huge cross-match here. Um, these are the metallicity distribution functions for uh, the spectroscopy surveys. And we're able to see uh, the hot thick disk contribution here. Uh, in each of them, and I will come back to them uh, in a while. So uh, in the pristine photometric metallicities, uh, with the color cuts where the distances are reliable, we have a cross match of about 0.36 million stars. And um, this is the metallicity distribution for those. So more number of stars means better characterization of the halo metallicity distribution. And uh, we also have more metal poor stars than the ones that are existing in the literature. So we have better chance of finding all the substructures as well. So the metallicity distribution peaks at minus 1.6, which is also consistent with the literature results. So here we see the thick disk contribution here. So uh, I thought of uh, constraining or quantifying the uh, hot thick disk contribution across different distances because we have more reliable distances in the sample. So um, this is a figure of quantifying the hot thick disk region in different distance bins. Um, and we're able to uh, get a lot of conclusions from this. Uh, one being the metal pore tail is uh, more pronounced as we go to higher distances and uh, the dispersion is less as well. And uh, the a peak of the metallicity distribution is also moving to a more metal poor end. And uh, at distances of like four to five kiloparsecs, the thick disk contribution almost disappears. I repeated the same for different scale heights. Uh, this is in positive scale heights. And uh, we see uh, almost the same consistent results at around four to five uh, kpc, the thick disk contribution almost disappears. Uh, this is a sky, uh, sky footprint of the pristine um, RPM cross match. Um, here, uh, I, I will be able to, because of the good distances and good metallicities, I will be able to um, 
plot the MDFs at different directions and uh, lines of sight. So I divided the sky region into different slots, uh, which are symmetric about both lo uh, longitudes and latitudes, and plotted the metallicity distribution functions. So this is for the uh, increasing longitudes, keeping the latitudes constant at 20 to 40. Uh, just for reference. So we can see that the uh, as we go to higher longitudes, the uh, peak shifts to a metal core end. Uh, so basically when we go uh, when we go near the anti-center, uh, it shifts more to the metal core end. And here is uh, this is almost consistent for increasing latitudes as well. And I also tried to quantify um, uh, to plot the MDFs at uh, low latitudes and high latitudes. In low latitudes, we don't have a lot of stars, but still we can see that they mostly follow the background halo distribution. But at high latitudes, it is interesting that we see a metal rich bump uh, in the high latitude region. Uh, and especially in the high longitude and latitude region, we see it a bit more pronounced because we have more stars there. Uh, I'm still looking into what causes this contribution. Uh, this uh, at higher distances, it, this could be because of the Sagittarius debris, but uh, at lower distances, I'm still looking at uh, what causes the metal rich bump. Uh, these are the metallicity distributions in different quadrants. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we don't have a pristine coverage in the third quadrant, as we can see from the figure. But uh, it's really interesting that um, we see an enhanced metal pore tail uh, in, in quadrant four that is highlighted here. Uh, so I thought of looking at this at like different um, distances, and we see that they are more pronounced at one to seven kiloparsecs. Uh, so in this region, I thought of, sure, thank you. In these distances, uh, I thought of looking at uh, the sky, the, the sky space, uh, and the, what are the existing substructures uh, that are there in the Streamfinder streams. So the Streamfinder is uh, an algorithm which assigns a probability that um, star belongs to a stream, uh, and um, this is the uh, region where I see. An overlap. So, uh, what I see is probably uh, an extension of the phlegaton stream, and uh, it, it is also a busy region. So, it is probably a few other streams that are crossing the phlegaton stream, as we can see. Uh, so, it is also uh, an ongoing work. So, uh, because I'm a part of the cool team, uh, I also get to collaborate uh, in a few other projects. Uh, we have a pristine stream finder project uh, in which we uh, in which we um, find the metallicities for the stream finder candidates, and this is a cross match of the pristine stream finder footprint. And uh, we are mining one of the lowest metallicity substructures in these um, so far that has been seen in the literature so far. And uh, with Pristine and we, we will have more ultra metal pore stars, uh, more than 30,000 uh, stars. So we're leaving no stones unturned. Uh, in the RPM sample in general, uh, we also find more substructures as we can see from the figure. This is a bin velocity moments in the sky at uh, higher distances. So distance is greater than, greater than six kiloparsec. And we see a lot of um, known and unknown substructures, which I am also probing into more. So to summarize, uh, our sample has a more pronounced metal pore tail with reliable distances. We're able to constrain the contributions of the thick disk and the metallicity distribution of the metal pore Milky Way halo and the structures in and around phlegaton could be studied more and a lot more substructures in the sample. Thank you for giving this opportunity uh, to present my work uh, and I'm open to answering some questions. Perfectly within time. Thanks very much, Akshar. Questions? I see lots of applause. Any questions from the audience? Oh, here's a, a question from, while well, we're waiting for the audience, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a question from Slack. Um, I see a super, this is from Rampka Bontaku again. I see a supervision of three Gaussian distributions in your models. Is there a specific argument for three components? Why not two or four? Uh, so in, okay. So it, uh, uh, the tree, tree is the one uh, with the least Bayesian information criteria uh, in the, oops, yeah. 
Yeah, that um, one. Yeah. yeah, in the 1D Gaussian, when I was trying to fit uh, them through the Gaussian mixture model, three was the one with the uh, three components was the one with uh, least Bayesian information criteria. And also my major motive was to constrain uh, the thick disk and the, the peak that we see due to the halo and the metal polar tail. So uh, it kind of made sense. Other questions for this interesting talk? Well, I can say that I'm incredibly excited to see this in view of what we'll find with Weave, of course, as 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 the Weave project side. This, I'm very excited to see that there's fantastic information on the the metal pore um, disc and and even lower. And once we can meet in person, I actually want to show you some cool stuff that one of my PhD students is doing, trying to do the same thing but using computer vision techniques rather than than uh, what you're doing. So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. Um, thanks very much. I see that actually perhaps it's time to move on to the next talk. So Tomas, are you ready for? Yeah, I'm here. So I'm going to try and okay, share my screen. Uh, okay, so I think you're seeing my screen now, right? We can see your screen. Oh, you, I hello. cannot see, you're just black on your screen, but uh, but that's okay. We can I'm, see your presentation. I'm so, black oh, there you and, are. Now, and now I'm here. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Okay, All right. thank you so much. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to, to thank the, the organizers for giving me this opportunity and also for putting together this uh, really nice uh, uh, meeting. My name is Tomas Ruiz Lara. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Captain Astronaut Binkal Institute working in Amina's, uh, in Amina Helmi's uh, group. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the computation of star formation histories from color magnitude diagrams using Gaia data. Uh, we know and we have already seen in the previous talk that Gaia is revolutionizing the field of galactic uh, archaeology. And in this particular case in which uh, we are interested in computing star formation histories from color magnitude diagrams, uh, the main uh, advantage of, uh, of, of Gaia is the fact that we can move now from color magnitude diagrams in the apparent uh, magnitude to, uh, to the absolute plane. So basically we can uh, uh, create uh, color uh, absolute magnitude uh, diagrams because we have uh, accurate distances to a huge amount of uh, stars in the, in, the, in the Milky Way. And the main advantage here is the fact that the stars don't fall in random positions in these uh, color absolute magnitude diagrams, but follow the evolutionary phases in which they are uh, located and, and, and also the, well, the stellar evolution theory. As, as we can see here, the stars uh, tend to, to follow a sequence of phases and metallicities depending on where they are located in the, in the, in the CMD. So basically, if we are able to go to synthetic CMDs and simulate observational errors as if they were observed uh, by, by Gaia and also take into account completeness, then uh, we can compare properly observations with models in order to obtain star formation histories. And by star formation histories, I mean several things. One is the, the star formation rate as a function of time, the average metallicity as a function of time as well, so basically the chemical enrichment. We can distinguish if there are uh, different uh, subpopulations in the metallicity age uh, plane. And more importantly, we can get uh, distributions of stellar metallicities and uh, stellar ages. And it is this distribution of stellar ages, which is uh, really something really uh, important in galactic archaeology, because we know that uh, uh, stellar ages are the main uh, missing piece of the puzzle that we need in, in galactic archaeology to, to reconstruct the past history of our galaxy. So given the importance of this particular thing, we wanted to, to test if uh, with, uh, we, with our techniques, we are really obtaining reliable distribution of uh, stellar ages. And basically we did this experiment in which uh, we created some mock stellar populations following a given uh, distribution of stellar ages, which is basically given by these uh, histograms in blue. So basically several bars of star formation. And then what we did is to simulate observational errors as if they were observed with Gaia, simulate completeness, and then uh, apply our techniques to see what uh, we get. The, the outcome are the, the, the red histograms that roughly corresponds with having a 10% accuracy in the determination of ages of individual stars, which is basically uh, 
the, the target of uh, that in the near future we will be able to get with uh, astroseismology. Here, let me clarify the fact that we are not getting, we are not computing ages for individual stars, but just uh, distribution of, uh, of ages. Whereas in the case of, uh, of uh, astroseismology, we can really date uh, uh, individual, individual stars. So basically, once that the methodology is more or less clear, we can move to unveil the secrets of our galaxy with uh, Gaia. And basically, uh, we will do this in two different steps. In the first step, we will concentrate on samples in in geometry, halo versus disk. So, see, disk. so basically, uh, uh, samples that behave uh, properly, let's say, uh, in Gaia, and it's, able, it's easy to simulate uncertainties, uh, clouding effects, and so on and so forth. And in the second step, we will try to move to stellar substructures defined in uh, integrals of motion. So let's start with the first part. Here, I will focus on these are results with uh, Gaia uh, DR2 data. Uh, for uh, analyzing a sphere of two kiloparsec radius around around the sound, taking into account uh, extinction, uh, interstellar extinction, and making some quality cuts, we end up having 24 million uh, stars. And basically, in this first part, I would like to focus in these uh, two uh, works. So, in the in the first one, we focus on the on the halo of the Milky Way. Since some decades ago, we know that the, there is some hints of the existence of two different uh, populations in the, in the inner galactic uh, halo, something that was uh, clearly shown in this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this plot, which is coming from the Babusio and collaborators paper from the uh, Gaia DR2 collaboration. Um, and basically what they did was to kinematically select a halo population where you can see the existence of these two components as uh, two parallel sequences in the main sequence uh, as well as in the, in the red uh, giant branch. Soon after that, uh, we'll, people try to, to understand the origin of these two sequences. So the blue sequence was associated to an accreted population, which is basically uh, Gaia and Celadus. And the red sequence, although well, it was associated to the thick disk. There were some controversy on the on the origin, mainly because of the lack of accurate ages uh, for these uh, stars, um, for a large number of these stars. So basically, what uh, we did is apply our uh, techniques to a halo uh, uh, population, and basically we got on the left you have the the, the stellar distribution, the stellar age distribution, the distribution of stellar ages of these stars. And in the right hand panel, you have the distribution of uh, stellar metallicities in red and blue, basically are the red and blue uh, sequences. And we can see that the, both sequences are coeval, so basically they share the same distribution of, uh, of ages, but they present differences in metallicities, being Gaia and Celadus, the, the, the more metal poor one. So basically, just having this information, you can clearly put uh, together the, the scenario. You know? It's like uh, at the early stages of the universe, you have two systems that are evolving independently, which is Gaia and Celadus and the progenitor of the, of, the, of the Milky Way with different masses. So basically, they have uh, different chemical enrichment and they end up having different uh, metallicities. At some point, at around 10 gigas years uh, ago, they, they merge uh, together. And basically, uh, uh, stars that were in this uh, in the progenitor of the Milky Way are heated up and they acquire kinematics compatible with the halo. And thus we have these uh, two components that we are seeing. The other uh, work that I would like to show is uh, basically concentrating now and treating the whole uh, the volume of two kiloparsec bubble around the sun as a, as a whole. Uh, and by putting everything together, we computed what we think is the most detailed star formation history to date, that in fact is representative to the, of the Milky Way disk. And basically this is what we got. So basically you, we can see that the star formation rate in the Milky Way declined with uh, time. But on top of that, we have some uh, enhancements of star formation at around, at around 5.5 billion years ago, 2 billion years ago, and 1 billion year ago. And this was really surprising. So basically, we wanted to to investigate was what was causing this uh, this event. So basically, we went to the to the literature, and we compiled uh, uh, all uh, predictions from uh, uh, of uh, pericentric passages of the Sagittarius uh, dwarf, as well as compile information about the star formation histories of the Sagittarius stream, as well as the Sagittarius uh, core. 
As you can see, it seems that the <coughs> predictions of the pericentric passage of Sagittarius pile up uh, at around the moments when we found these uh, enhancements in the star formation. But not only that, if we focus on the star formation history of uh, M54, which is the, the, the core of, uh, of, uh, of the Sagittarius group galaxy, we have this image that let me flip it and add uh, just to, to guide the eye these uh, green areas. We can see that the parallelism between the star formation history of the Milky Way and, and, and the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy is quite uh, remarkable. So basically we can uh, conclude that Sagittarius was not only important in the uh, affecting the dynamics of our galaxy, but also it was an important actor in the building up of the Milky Way uh, disk uh, stellar mass. And now, as I said, the next step would go would be to, to go a step further because basically everything was like well behaved uh, samples. But uh, now we will, we want to move from geometry to phase space to obtain star formation histories of stellar substructures in the Milky Way heaven blocks of the of, of our galaxy. And for that, we have uh, two important problems. One is how to select uh, those stars. So the sample selection is extremely important. And the other thing is the completeness, how with the completeness in, in order to really be able to compare synthetic uh, color magnitude diagrams with uh, observation. So the first uh, system that, that we have tried, uh, we have started analyzing is the, the Helm streams. Let me highlight the fact that we are still working on the, on the procedure and improving the methodology. So basically this is very much a work in progress, but uh, here in this uh, part of the slide, you can see the, well, the sample selection of this uh, system that uh, ideally would be in, in, in 6D following well, this uh, spatial distribution of stars and having this, uh, this orbital information. But uh, uh, taking into account all the uh, observational bias into in, in the 6D sample, we need to, uh, to move to 5D and things uh, complicate uh, a little bit. So we have to take into account all this to, to simulate completeness and to simulate uh, everything, but uh, we have been able to simulate in synthetic CNDs the exact observ uh, observed uh, conditions that we have in the, in the Helmi streams in order to simulate not only observational errors, but uh, also uh, completeness. And then once that we have done that, we have this, what we call dispersed uh, synthetic uh, CNDs, then we can compare with the observations. And as I said, this is really preliminary. I don't even going to talk about the different details because this might uh, change uh, for sure. But the idea is that uh, we will select a, a, a control sample uh, representative of the halo and another sample representative of the different structures that uh, we are analyzing. And by running our method and comp comparing these star formation histories, our method will allow us to uh, unveil possible differences, for example, evolution differences in the evolution of the star formation rate as a function of time, different chemical enrichment histories, different quenching uh, times of the star formation, and so on and so forth. So basically, I think that I'm running out of time. So basically, I will uh, leave here my conclusions. But I would like to highlight the fact that uh, I really think that this uh, CMD fitting technique is something really important that they will add the time direction dimension to galactic uh, archaeology works uh, right now and it could be like a really good appetizer to uh, stellar astroseismology applied to a really large uh, sample of, uh, of stars and not only that uh, we will be able now to get the star formation histories uh, in building blocks of the milky way stellar superstructures other parts so the best is uh, about to come so basically that's it Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have questions, I will try to, to answer them. Thanks, Tomas. Are there questions from the audience? Uh, Tamor, would you like to just answer your question directly? Ask your question directly? Yeah, sure. Uh, very nice talk, Thomas. Uh, okay. I have a question about M40, sorry, M54 yeah. and the fact that uh, you said it is. It has been a nuclei of uh, Sagittarius dwarf, right? So, yeah. how certain are we about this, and what is, what is the existing evidence for saying that? Well, to, to be honest, I think that uh, you you caught me there. <laughs> uh, well, M fifty four is a is a globular cluster, and I think that. Uh, 
there are works claiming that uh, this was like the, the core of Sagittarius that now it's in, in disruption. So you have like uh, the main body, you have as well the, the, the stellar stream. But uh, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what are the, 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 the certainties of M54 being that, but it's something that is quite well accepted. So I, I can dig some, some bibliography for you, but uh, I don't know if someone in the audience it might uh, provide a better answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe Elsa or Amina, if you're still there. Yeah, it's right at the center of the Sagittarius dwarf. So that's why um, it's thought to be its nuclear star cluster. I, I was not sure if it was in the center, it's like, it's exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. but if it's in the center, it's like the probability is quite high. No? Okay, thanks. Um, Gabriela? Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. So I, I was wondering if you can comment about how this uh, star formation history compares with the one derived from the white dwarf cooling sequence. They don't find these very big uh, bursts, and I wonder if this can be explained by, I don't know, they have smaller sizes, or you think there are larger un uncertainties, or something else if if i recall properly i think that the, they also claim probably not all the all the bars but they also claim that there is like a, an enhancement of the star formation close to five six uh, giga years ago that in fact i think that they also suggest that there could be a link with uh, with study in 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 that uh, in that sense and regarding the other the other two the other two uh, uh, enhancements, they are quite uh, young. So I don't know if, uh, I mean, we know all the, the difficulties no, no, of, uh, of getting ages from, from white dwarfs. Mm -hmm. So I get that it, it could be a, a problem with the, with the age resolution that in, in, especially in this uh, age range is where we have like the, the best uh, resolution. There are other, other works computing as well star formation histories and uh, in the in the milky way and uh, and again it's like it seems that uh, we all tend to agree with this enhancement at uh, around 6 uh, giga years but it is in the in the more recent uh, ones when we start uh, having some some discrepancies so i guess that it's mainly due to the to the age resolution and uh, but uh, as we can see here is something that we see quite uh, clearly with more than three sigma significance. So, so I think that it's mainly related to uh, the, 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 the age resolution that the different works uh, have. So I think that it's a matter of time, hopefully, that uh, we can uh, agree on, on this uh, fact. Maybe very shortly, if you can also comment on another famous Milky Way star formation history by Haywood, where there is a, a flat uh, star formation history at ancient times, and then a sudden drop at eight giga years or something like that, which is based on chemical evolution models. Maybe you are not aware of this. So, so now I'm, I'm not aware of that particular work, but basically what you are saying is that uh, the star formation rate was higher. I am I'm more not than saying, eight giga years ago or more recent than eight giga years ago. I am not saying. Given, given, the given the time, perhaps we can take this to Slack and you guys can have a discussion of this on Slack. Okay. Um, yes, we, we need to move on to the next talk. But thanks very much for your question, Gabriel. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. And thanks, Tomas. Thank you. Um, so the next talk is um, by Violetta uh, Gomez Rosas. Violetta has asked that this not be recorded. So, um, because it's in, uh, it, it's under review at Nature, apparently. And so, um, Petra, can you turn off the recording, please? Yes, of course. Thanks. Violetta. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. And we can see your screen. Ah, perfect. So, I guess I have to play it. Yes. Can you still see it? Yes. Great. Okay, so, well, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I feel very fortunate about this. And um, so I will talk to you about NGC 1068 and the uh, most recent work that we have been doing with uh, Matisse observations. 